Hello you, it's me. Today we're going to talk about Starve Acre by Andrew Michael Hurley, a Lancashire lad, uh, which is a folk horror set in the English countryside. The book's about a couple who inherit a house from the husband's father and move out to the countryside uh, to raise their five-year-old son. The hope is they'll become a part of village life, their son will be happy playing in the outdoors, they'll achieve a degree of peace and escape from city life, but the house is soured by the husband's memories of his father's decline mentally when he lived there. There's a series of tragic events uh, that eventually lead up to the death of the couple's son, Ewan, and they're thrown into a storm of grief. The wife, Juliet, becomes obsessed with contacting the spirit of her deceased son, uh, invite, recording EVPs in his room, inviting a psychic medium to perform a seance in their house, Starvaker, which stands at the edge of a vast stretch of moor at the top of a completely barren field of mud. While the husband, in the wake of the child's death, becomes obsessed with digging in the mud outside the house for the remnants of an ancient tree, an oak, which once stood there and was used to hang criminals called Old Justice. Against the advice of others in the village who watched his father go mad digging for the exact same thing. The book alternates between the present with a couple dealing with their grief in these alarming ways and the past, the months leading up to Ewan's death, where he becomes increasingly and worryingly cruel and violent, acting out of character and claiming that he's being told to do things by the mysterious bogeyman Jack Gray. This is a very quick book to read. It's about 200 pages. The pacing is really well done. Uh, it's split into quite short sections, alternating between past and present. And the font is quite big, actually. So you could probably smash through this in an afternoon if you really wanted to. It really gains speed and a feeling of anxiety and unease towards the end. And I really couldn't put it down. And one of the things I thought was done so well was the parallel between the past and present. It discloses to you right at the start of the book that Ewan dies. So on one hand, you've got the events leading up to the child's death and the building fear and tension, and you know what's coming. And in the present time narrative, you have the same build up, but you don't know what's at the end of it. So there's this real feeling of tension and you're like, oh my God, oh my God, where is this going? So you can just feel this thing rushing to meet you. And the ending, I was like, wow. I will say some people might not like how abrupt the ending of the book was, um, but I really liked it. For me, this book had quite a similar feel to Lanny by Max Porter, uh, which I have reviewed. I'll link the review for that one in the description. It's definitely a folk horror, but I guess you could class this as a thriller if you really wanted to. What makes this book good is the prose. Geography and landscape play such an important part in this book, and the beautiful descriptions of the village of Starvaker make this book worth reading, even if you're not into the story, but I was into the story. If you're expecting original content you may only be sort of half happy with this book because obviously it does play to some cliche horror tropes i guess couple moved to the country in a strange house inherited from a relative local customs and semi-religions exclusion from community on the grounds of being an outsider and other people's resentment of you for that there's cliche here in terms of setting um but the character development is really good it's really solid realistic and believable so the cliches are fine. They work, really. i said it before, and I'll say it again. I love when landscape is integral to a story. And when a story wouldn't make sense if it was removed from the setting that it's in. And honestly, Starvaker, the house, the landscape around it, felt like a character in this story because it's described so well. And how closely tied in it was to all the elements of the storytelling. I think a lot of what folk horror is is exaggerations and blowing out of proportion all the tiny little things that make the countryside annoying that blown up out of proportion become horrifying. But then I guess most horror is the exaggeration of bad stuff. Uh, but I mean specifically in terms of the countryside. The weird exclusionism, the not knowing where you are, the cut off uh, between you and modernity. Even like mud and dirt. But I do love the theme of small villages uh, having some basis in old-time pre-Christian religion with these terrifying but tangible and knowable gods. The main themes of this book are based around parenting and the emotions associated with that. Building a picture of a child in your mind and trying to shape somebody into that, although not necessarily somebody like you. The parental guilt when anything goes wrong. You're wondering what you're doing in not bringing them up a certain way. 
the fear and anger about what's happening outside of the bubble that's influencing your child that's beyond your control. The strain that having a child puts on a couple in terms of you might have very different styles of parenting and what one person thinks is something to be alarmed about, the other might think is just a developmental stage. The idea when raising a child of should I be worrying about this or are they crazy or am I crazy? And I think that must constantly be difficult for parents, especially of young children, worrying either that you're underreacting or overreacting. And put that feeling in a tense situation of escalating horror makes for a really good story and an interesting set of characters. One of the lines I really liked in here was when Juliet asks her husband, do you like Ewan as a person? It really raises an interesting question. Can you love somebody without liking them? And are you obligated to like your child? One thing I liked about this book is the narrative leading up to Ewan's death. You can really sympathise with Richard uh, in his refusal to believe anything otherworldly is happening in terms of sort of Jack Gray, the bogeyman, whispering in his son's ear. And even in the present timeline, this denial carries over and you've got these unexplainable things happening but the refusal to believe is still very much there. So you really, well, I really, was weighing up the whole time. Is this something supernatural happening, or are these symptoms of untreated mental illness? Does Ewan have some kind of uh, mental disability that's not being treated, and X and Y are symptoms of this? And in the present, are the unexplainable things that are happening, because we are looking at it from Richard's point of view, symptoms of his repressed grief? and his mental instability following the loss of his son. There's a lot of ambiguity in this story, and I think by the end of the story, it would be very easy for anybody to argue either way. Also, in terms of dealing with grief, I really like the metaphor of the two extremes in this book, where Juliet turns to seances and spiritual contact, and Richard is literally digging. So it's, it's the down-to-earth and the head in the clouds just blown way out of proportion. I really like that and the refusal of both of them to accept the other's methods of dealing with grief. You also get the resentment uh, of a character when somebody else starts to move out, out of their grief, and the almost sadistic way that one can drag others back down into grief just so they're not alone. I'm going to give this book four stars. I really liked it, and I'd like to read it again. It's a very short read. There's not much I can actually tell you about the story without spoiling a lot of what happens in it, because a lot of it is very surprising and shocking. So that was my attempt at a spoiler-free review. Quite a lot of the way through it, I felt it had quite similar vibes to Ian Banks' The Wasp Factory, um, also, as well as Max Porter's Lanny. So if you haven't read The Wasp Factory and you like this, read that. Or if you like The Wasp Factory, uh, then read this. But yeah, that's it. Um, thanks very much for watching. If you've read this, let me know what you thought in the comments. If you'd like to read it, drop a like and subscribe. There's more coming, more reviews all the time, read pretty quick. Uh, I'll drop content warnings down below, link to my Twitter, so follow me on there. And thanks very much for watching, I'll see you soon.